70% of critical decisions that are me being made in a hospital are based on technology that my company is delivering. So, as a company, we do have a responsibility for society and for healthcare. And therefore, we pioneer breakthroughs in healthcare for everyone, everywhere. Because there's still 3 billion people who do not have proper access to healthcare. And we want to do that sustainably for this generation, but for the generations to come as well. So, we are currently having a three-body problem in healthcare. But in order to explain you the three-body problem, I need you to take you back, in, back to space. So, buckle up, let's go back to space. Okay, I see some people already long in space, okay. Um, so, we are in space. You have two, let's say, planets. If we know their position, their velocity, we know how they will evolve in time. We have the formulas for it. But if you had to add a third planet to it, it's a different thing. Then you're adding, you're getting into the chaos theory. And that's exactly where we're currently at in healthcare. First topic, our hospitals in Belgium are currently losing money. If you take the sum of all the hospitals together, one big problem. Second problem is the workforce problem. Every year, 40,000 people are adding to the age of 65 plus. We have more and more chronic diseases, so the need for healthcare is increasing. On the other hand, we're seeing the workforce, the hospitals can't fill the vacancies. That has been increasing last year with 20%. So based on an assumption of Agoria, by 2030, we would require 112,000 additional people to work for healthcare but we can't find them. Third topic, Dr. Google. I myself witnessed it when, when the, my youngest uh, son was born. When he was crying, he was crying asymmetrically. So that was immediately a red flag for the doctors. So I needed to do additional exams, at, and I didn't get the information that I wanted. So what did I do? I started to Google, I was reading some articles, and oh my God, I couldn't sleep that night. But just to say that patients are wanting to have more information. They would like to be empowered. They would like to get a decision on their treatment. Not just, please follow this, but they would like to be involved. So they would like to get personalized care. And that is difficult. We did two other things together. We can't find the people. We don't have the finances for it. So if you bring those together, this is a tricky situation. But there's as well a future. Because never waste a good crisis, said Winston Churchill. And that's true. If you look to the history, a lot of technology came out of periods of crisis. Let's take, for example, the internet. During the Cold War, there was, they needed reliable connectivity. That, based on this, internet was, was found out. During COVID, we couldn't visit our doctors any longer. So teleconsulting started to happen as well. Now 70% is okay with teleconsult with their doctor. So this opens perspective as well for healthcare, to open new innovations. So what I will do now, I will show you a couple of examples of new prototypes of, of products along a patient journey, a typical path that a potential patient could follow. And I will jump from the different disciplines, from cardiology to oncology, just to highlight what technology can do in order to improve patient experience and efficiency. So we start, patient gets in, we first we need additional exams. For example, we start with scanning. Then a doctor is reading those images. Then there's a decision on the therapy. And then there's therapy planning, therapy delivery, and at last there is the follow-up. Let's start with the scanning. My company loves donuts. And those donuts, they make images, 3D images, by using X-ray or by using a magnet. It's a bit like you see on the bread. So what we're currently doing, we're, we're slicing the patient, and then the doctor is looking onto the slices to see what, what's in that patient. That's basically what, what we're doing. And what you're seeing on top there, so you see someone is taking care of the patient, and on top you see a camera. 
and the camera is helping the technologist who's, who's running the scanner um, with the patient. So it's this 3D camera, based on AI, is looking if the patient is positioned well, if the right scanning parameters are being chosen, and if the height is, is correct. So manual tasks are being moved away from the technologist so the technologist can focus on the anxiety, for example, of the patient. And it can improve the workflow. Like a typical scanner requires two persons. One to take care of the patient and the other one to make the images, to do the reconstructions. So let's take, for example, a fleet of three, three MRI scanners. You require six people. But due to automation, more and more tasks have been automated. So what we can do now is centrally have one expert do the scans for the three, page, uh, for the three scanners. And then you can have dedicated people looking after the patient. And even more, because this central person, he can work as well from home, for example. Or this person can do as well scans for another hospital. And that's what we're currently doing. So currently people in Aze Delta Ruslara are scanning for a hospital in Kizete, Antwerp. So if we now can do more patients, right? the doctor that needs to read those patients, he needs to work harder. But luckily, there's AI. AI is magnificent for reading images. They love to find patterns. And that's exactly what radiologist is doing. Will it replace radiologist? I don't think so. But it will assist it. It will assist the radiologist and say, please have a look there. Here, I did an automatic measurement for you. So it will help and automate the workflow and leading to better outcomes. Let's now, so we, we scanned the patient, we did the analysis, we need to choose a therapy. Some therapies are not so efficient. For example, resynchronization therapy. What's basically happening, you have an electric shortcut in the heart, and that leads to asynchronous um, movement of the heart. So in order to, to fix this, what they do, they go with cables from the groin to the heart, and they make small ablations. So small parts in the heart is, are being ablated in order to, to stop the shortcut. But what we see is that a big portion of that therapy is not working. These are the non-responders. They need to do this long therapy, and at the end of the day, nothing happens. So what if we could use those images we had from the past and make like a virtual heart? So based on that virtual heart, we could simulate and see what the impact is going to be on a therapy. We could plan it and see if that makes sense to do the treatment, yes or no. And we're more and more moving into that direction of digital twinning. And here you see a small video on how the ablation could be done or can be planned. Let's now move to the next one. Let's move now from cardiology to oncology, where we try to kill the cancer using radiation therapy. What the radiation physicist is doing, he's contouring the organs in order to have a map of everything that, that potentially can be, can be irradiated. And he's making um, an oncology plan, a radiation plan, and he's trying to avoid certain criti critical organs. And this is a task that takes a lot of time, but as well can be perfectly, um, AI can do this as well. And AI is, no, is not suffering from a Friday afternoon, late hours, not having slept so well. So here as well, AI can help to, to better do personalized care. Let's now move to surgery. So, You've seen those, those slices, those bread slices in the beginning. Radiologists, they love it. But the surgeon, he wants to see 3D things because he will operate as well in a 3D fashion, so not in 2D. So that's why we're developing photorealistic images of the anatomy based on the scanners we did before. And that is helping the surgeon to do and to plan the treatment. But we take it one step further. We bring those images into the operating theater by using augmented reality. And then the doctor can actively manipulate the images, as you see here, and even punch through um, 
the head of the patient and to see exactly what's happening inside it. So after treatment has been done, let's now go to the, to the follow-up. So if we take the 3D camera we had on the CT scanner, and we push that a bit further, because that scanner can as well detect patients, detect movements, and that could help, for example, in intensive care units, where they require five nurses per patient uh, for a complete day. Very intense. So, before COVID, usually you had rooms of, let's say, four patients. So the nurse could have a visual inspection of the four patients at once. But of course, after COVID, if one had COVID, all the intensive care patients had COVID. So they moved away from that to individual rooms. But that makes it much more difficult to get an overview on those patients. So therefore, if we use that 3D scanner, uh, that 3D camera, that can trigger then an alarm to the nurse in order if, they, if, for example, a patient would like to get out of the tube. But as well, for example, if you think of paralyzed patients, they can't push the button. So if they blink twice, this could as well trigger an alert to the nurse in order to do the follow-up. So I gave a couple of examples, small things on how technology can help can have an impact on the efficiency, on better patient experience, and improve healthcare outcomes. But this is just the beginning. We are at a new era in healthcare. If you look back, in 1950, it took 50 years for the medical knowledge to double. In 1980, it took eight years. Today, it takes 72 days. So, it is impossible to stay on top of this. So, therefore, of course, we will require large language models. We will require general AI to make sure that we make use of that information. And then we get to the best, best possible solutions. And we will not only require people in the healthcare, in the hospitals, but we will require as well people developing new technologies and making sure that those technologies can get into the hospitals and make a difference. Because at the end of the day, our aim is to fight for a world without fear of disease. I thank you. <laughs>